So good evening, great debaters, and I know that you're getting ready for your first encounter at Sherman uh, next week, uh, followed by the six-day programs and the Midwest Great Debate, the Northeast Great Debate, the uh, Great Debate at, at Texas, uh, University of Texas, and uh, places like that, and the Lone Star down at Our Lady of the Lake. Uh, I think it's an exciting program, it's an exciting experience. Uh, thank you parents for the trust. Thank you students for allowing us the opportunity to uh, share this experience with you. Uh, a little bit of history about where this program got started. Many years ago, I used to see young Latinas and Latinos do really well uh, on the uh, math portions of their SAT or the ACT and maybe not do as well as they wanted to on the verbal section. Uh, consequently, they would uh, get admitted to college, uh, but maybe fall somewhat short of the requirements for merit scholarships, which, is the, which are scholarships that are not required to be paid back. They're done on the basis of excellence. They're awarded on that basis, on the basis of merit. So we decided, what, what, what is it that we can do uh, as, a, as an organization to maybe improve uh, the linguistic capacities of our young men and women. In particular, I was interested in the thought process, thought leaders, people who think and perceive and can express in the abstract, not simply literalists, and uh, people that could understand symbolically the meaning of things. Uh, I was very curious about that. And this young man by the name of J.C. Cruz one day suggested to me that maybe we ought to form our own debate programs. Uh, he didn't mean UIL type. He meant the kind of, uh, of debate format that would allow us to examine our future roles as future leaders, addressing various themes, concerns, priorities, plans, vision, etc., etc. And uh, we decided to do this. We model tested it in 1985 on the campus of Southwestern University in Georgetown. And guess what? There were only three teams that first participated, and that was the Texas Rio Grande Valley, uh, the other one was uh, uh, Houston, and the other one was Austin. And uh, the RGV won hands down uh, in most categories. The format was slightly different. Three years later, uh, we took the program to uh, uh, St. Mary's University, uh, by this time under the directorship of my daughter, Nicole. Nieto Nausada, and uh, the program has continued uh, throughout for many, many years. And at Austin College, as a matter of fact, we're going to now celebrate the 25th anniversary, meaning 25 consecutive years of celebrating and conducting this particular program experience. Always, the great debate is designed to, to offer students challenging themes and topics relating to the Latino community that they may have, that they may encounter in the future, that they may wish to encounter in the future, or that they envision talking about as relevant and pertinent to their, to, to their futures as they grow older, as they uh, finish college, as they marry, as they have children, as they move forward in society. This year in particular, uh, we chose the whole concept of hemispheric identity, meaning this, because this is what's on the table, that as we grow uh, and mature as a community, it is very possible that we will stop seeing ourselves as individual groups of Mexicans or Mexican-Americans or Dominicans or Puerto Ricans or South Americans or Central Americans or people from El Salvador, people from Argentina, and stop seeing ourselves uh, as people from nation states with individual personalities and individual customs and individual outlooks and perceptions and to beginning to see ourselves as a unified hemisphere with a unified purpose. The question is, is it possible over the next 20 to 30 years? Is it something of benefit to us? Are there disadvantages involved? What should we consider? Where do we start? Who promotes this? Uh, those are good questions. Uh, and things do not have to have answers. 
uh, maybe perceptions, opinions, and views, uh, but certainly not firm answers because we're always investigating alternatives. So this summer, we thought it would be fun for young high school freshmen to share with us their views, their opinions, and, and, how, and how they perceive the future for themselves and how they perceive the future in terms of where we're moving as a modern day society. I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, I'm going to be very interested in uh, listening to the answers. But first, I want to share a couple of things with students uh, in their preparation. I just got through uh, visiting with a group in, in Austin where NHI first got started in 1979. And I was sharing with the students this, that if you come to the great debate, come prepared to do your best. Come uh, spend the time uh, being ready for whatever challenge you've been assigned to address, whether it's cross X, whether it's mock trial, whether it's extamp, whatever it may be, oratory, uh, whatever it may be, uh, be prepared to do your best. Commit the time and the energy. Read the book, Third Reality. There, there are a lot of uh, uh, support statements in there. There are a lot of questions in that book that relate to the subject at hand, about identity, about the future, about perception, about views, and about attitudes. Uh, that was one of the question, one of the points that I made to the group this afternoon. The second thing I said is that see yourself as a winner. Don't ever participate without the idea of winning. Now, some people may say, well, too much emphasis is placed on winning. I place a lot of emphasis on winning because winning is what creates excellence. The idea of being a winner, the idea of being ahead, the idea of coming out ahead to me underscores something that I take the time to be so good at what I do that I expect to do well no matter the intensity and no matter the, the level of competition. So I do not back off winning. I tell the staff, I'm not used to losing. I, I, I'm, I'm not used to doing only, only so much. I'm used to making sure that we're prepared as an organization, that you're prepared as a student to do your very best. But we all know whether we prepare or not. If you do not prepare well, don't expect to do well. Because there will be students there who come there with the attitude of not only winning, but walking away with a goal and eventually walking away with that amazing silver cup. So I plan to see you uh, at Austin College to kick off the great debate. I also plan to be at the Texas program, uh, the University of Texas. I plan to be over at, uh, at, at uh, Our Lady of the Lake. I will not be able to make all the programs. I think I'll be at Villanova. Uh, but I do not plan to be at all the programs, but I, I trust that you're going to do well and that you're going to be very prepared to do your very best and operate and conduct yourself at the top level. Now, I wanted to go over, and I'm, I've got Julio recording this uh, particular presentation so that we can basically go over and develop some uniformity of understanding regarding the issues at hand. Mom and Dad, if you're listening, uh, maybe we can all think this through together. Uh, when we talk about cross-examination, uh, and I'm going to read to you, it says the topic, it says resolve that the work of the National Hispanic Institute be redefined to focus on the development of leaders for, for unified hemispheric Latino communities. You think about that, about what does it mean? I'm going to ask you to always ask yourself questions. What does it mean? What could it mean? What, what does that statement infer? Or what does it mean for me? What does it mean for the future? It means that maybe right now the way in which we train our young people, educate our young people, is to see themselves as individual entities tied by nationality, by boundaries, by other kinds of divisions like ideologies, uh, by ways of life, and so forth. And the issue then, if we're teaching our children to think in only spheres, or should I say silos, or definitions that are uniquely ours and different from the others, is it possible to build a hemispheric identity? Obviously, to me, the answer would be no. So the question is, so is it important to have 
a hemispheric identity. And so the affirmative is always going to argue for change. So the inferred status quo, the inferred status quo is that we teach uh, young people to have separate identities by nation states, by geography, by customs and traditions, things of that nature, and that we tend to create barriers and divisions among people that do not build a unified identity or understanding of ourselves. So the resolve is essentially saying that the status quo is injurious or in, is injuring or, or, or creating harm to our future and therefore is calling for change. Keep in mind that the affirmative always calls for change by pointing out the injury, the harm, the extent of harm, and the scope of harm and injury that's being created. The affirmative has to prove, the burden of proof is that enough harm is being created to, to, to create injury. And then also state the extent and scope of injury if that matter remains unresolved. So what is it, therefore, that the opposition does? The opposition, I always tell young people, it means that you must be a good listener to the presentation of the affirmative. The, somewhere in the affirmative, there will be weaknesses in the arguments being presented. Your job, if you're part of the opposition, is to wait and record those weaknesses, those observations, those views that may not be very supportable. And when it comes your turn to not only cross-examine, but summarize your views, the only thing that you need to argue is what the weaknesses of the affirmative was. It is not your purpose to state a different case. It is not your purpose to, to, to bring to the table another point of view. It is strictly your purpose to find weaknesses and point out those weaknesses to the extent that you're saying to the judge, the affirmative does not have a sufficient grounds or sufficient case for change. I want to make sure that we understand that so that the opposition within the cross-examination doesn't find itself feeling that they have to create a different case and a different point of view that counters what's being forwarded by the affirmative. Make sure you understand that because we're going to ask the judges to downgrade and take points away when you begin to offer an alternative. It is not your job, opposition, to offer an alternative. It is only your job to find weaknesses and point out those weaknesses and the arguments of the affirmative to the extent that they cannot support their case for change. So now let's turn over briefly and look at oratory. And in oratory, it says here that the Latino community has been presented as an unorganized collection of regional, ethnic, or national groups. It goes on to say, given the trend and so forth, as part of your challenge, make a case for sparking a new youth social movement. Now listen to that word, or that phrase, should I say, a new youth social movement that promotes a unified hemispheric social identity. Let's make sure you understand that oratory is a reflection of expression and drama and the way in which you present a case must be compelling. It must be, it must be, it must have drama written to it. It must be convincing and that, be, and that must be forceful. These are things that are that, that, can, that are made up in your presentation. Whatever point of view you design for yourself, it has to be driven hard. It has to have a, a bit of theater to it. It has to be dramatic. Uh, it needs to be something that the listener remembers. But the challenge you're being asked to present as well from a content point of view is that you define what that new social movement is. And when you define the new social movement, you must show why the benefits are there, what's expected to be achieved, what are going to be the new advantages over the current condition, and what's going to make it compelling. Why is it believable? Why is it something that we should, we should believe and support? If you can remember those points, and whatever you're constructing, whatever ideas 
you're moving, you're, you're placing on the table, make sure that it is supportable and that it makes sense and that it's compelling and that you offer that theater, uh, that use of gestures, the voice, the drama, the eye contact, all those things beyond ideas that convince the judge to, to listen and to be convinced that what you're doing is worth listening to. When you move to the subject of extemporaneous speaking, it's, it's very similar overall that is still a hemispheric identity. It says that the education of Latino youth and their Latin American counterparts uh, deal with that the use of, of chapters free in the mind, uh, their suggestion to you in the literature, what chapters in, in the book Third Reality Craft in a 21st Century you should read as references as you present your case. In this case, we're still de dealing with the whole concept of, of hemispheric identity among young people. What they're asking you to do is that when you're given the question or the prompt question, that when you go back to put together a response to the prompt question on the table, that you specifically use information found in various chapters, free in the mind, proof, which means proceed only on faith, and then conflicts and identity to make a case to, to support the question you're being asked to address. And in doing that, what they're saying is what frame of reference should be presented to U.S. Latinos and Latino American youth? What are the effects of adopting a new cultural perspective? Anytime someone says a new cultural perspective, you must ask yourself the question, in contrast to what? What is the old cultural perspective? Well, there are a bunch of answers to that. We have nation state identities, different customs, even the way in which we enunciate and, 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 and deliver language, ideas about how we live. We think we're very different. We think we're very unique. Uh, the idea is how do you weld that together? How do you weld together a modern new identity that encompasses all young people? What does that mean? What are the advantages of that? Maybe what are the disadvantages? Who knows? You think about it because you're going to be living in that world. You're going to be living in the world of tomorrow and you've got two choices. Either you follow the rules of those who are aggressive enough to set the agenda or you become the agenda setter. That's your choice. We believe, as part of the National Hispanic Institute, that it is our responsibility as a community to set our own future national and international agenda. If we want a new hemispheric identity, if we want to unify our countries and communities, if we want more of a solidarity understanding of ourselves, we must learn to make the case for ourselves. And it must be believable, it must be compelling. And so I finally move to the last part. And it talks about, it talks about the mock trial. And in the mock trial, there is what is called the, uh, the issue proper for trial. And I, and I want to quickly refer to what has been written about what is on the table that the attorneys, whether you're the plaintiff or the, the defendant attorney, uh, what's being discussed. It says here, uh, publishers of Latin American and U.S. Latino history in its current forms inhibit the development of a common purpose in pursuit of solidarity among young people who share similar historical, cultural, and linguistic similarities and backgrounds. What does that mean? It says that the way in which books are being published by publishers and by writers inhibit the development of a common purpose, meaning that the inference is that we develop books that are, that are nation state driven, meaning only for Mexico or only for Argentina or only for uh, the United States or only within the context of US life. And that we don't appear to give a complete historical understanding of how we even come to be on, in this part of the world. Where did we come from? How did we form our societies? Who were our national heroines and heroes? What are events that we share in common? What are the things that make us a people that's unified, that have a similar history, a similar sense of, of, of events that impacted our lives, 
a similar similar types of experiences that form how we see the world and what the, the deal is by the uh, by the by the plaintiff attorney it is it is attacking people who write history books as being overly limited in the way and context in which those books are written to the effect that even if we learned about Mexican history for example we do it in a vacuum because we know no one else's history and that it's important to know the history of Puerto Rico and the, and the history of other Latin American countries so that we can see the similarities and things we share in common. That is the complaint and so what, 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 the, what the plaintiff attorney is arguing at this point is that in the absence of preaching a unified understanding of ourselves, we become divisive and we see ourselves as separate from one, uh, from one another and it has, it has a caustic impact of us seeing ourselves as being individual nations who may or may not like each other, including FIFA, right? Including the great soccer matches of our of our times, including that we may not like the way people behave or even their, their the colors of, of their flags or what those countries represent. So the idea is that the way in which these books are published and the way in which we sort of see the future is driven by that kind of literature that we're being asked to, to read. So what does the defendant attorney has to do? It has to, the defendant attorney has to do two things. It has to pick weaknesses in the argument of the plaintiff, and it can show that what the plaintiff attorney is suggesting, or in fact charging, is not true. But the evidence has to be there that 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 the way in which we're addressing this matter does not create, does not create division. For example, it could be that the National Hispanic Institute is attempting to uh, 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 develop uh, programs in other Latin American countries and maybe, maybe even tailor our, our programs to the cultural views and needs of those societies. Well, we're promoting unity by doing that, at least we think we are, but according to the argument, by doing it that way, uh, we may be inadvertently creating divisions. Uh, I think not, but at least that's just my opinion. The idea behind the defendant attorney is to show the weaknesses of the argument of the plaintiff and show maybe why the way in which we're doing things is beginning to create a hemispheric identity, if in fact, that is the direction we want to pursue, that is the goal of what we want to pursue, that's, that's the, 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 the emphasis that we want to underscore and the developing the mindsets of our future leaders. So you have these two opposing views. Which one dominates depends on how well prepared you are, how you organize your thoughts, how you present your thoughts, how you present your arguments, and how you counter each other. Main difference between cross-examination and mock trial is that in cross-examination, you don't present a counter view. In mock trial, you can. In mock trial, not only can you diffuse or weaken the argument of the plaintiff, but you can actually suggest even a better model. So long as you're prepared to defend it and to argue it and to, and to make sure that it's part of your, uh, of, of your presentation. So that makes mock trial different than CWS, but at any time you present a case, you want to make sure that your, that your witness person is prepared to, to share the evidence of whatever it is the, the, the defendant attorney is trying to get across. I hope that I've not muddied the waters. I hope that I've given you some degree of clarity and uniformity as you approach this very, very important uh, mission of arguing things that, uh, honestly, Latinos, youth of the past, I know in my generations, other generations, we never considered. This is an opportunity for you to have a voice in your own future. This is an opportunity for you to be an author of your own development. This is an opportunity for you to stand up and be counted about your ideas and the value of your ideas and what you recommend to other young people your age to perceive and to adopt and to embrace is thinking patterns and things that we want to be, we want, we wish considered as, as, as we proceed forth through the ages. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say this about the great debate. Uh, it's one of my favorite programs because it offers a very fundamental opportunity for young people to create stage, a stage for themselves, 
to deliver ideas that are not normally discussed in, in school, uh, high school, and in particular in college. These are things that, that just don't happen. Oftentimes what we talk about is being minorities, is being disconnected, is being people of, uh, uh, who are disadvantaged, is being a society that's at risk. None of these arguments here suggest that. It suggests we're in control, we're the designers, we're the innovators, and we're the authors of our own future. Have a great time. I'll be there. I'll enjoy the experience, and I hope you do too. Good luck to you.